I have with me today Rachel Grant. Uh, she is a coach for sexual abuse recovery, and we're going to get into a conversation about where she comes from, how she's gotten into this work, and and the good that she is doing for people uh, across the nation. Welcome, Rachel. Ah, uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to have you. So, tell me how you got into this field like how this became your 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 thing to do your your goal your dream your your work oh amazing well you know like many journeys uh mine is a wiggly one <laughs> didn't necessarily set out um to become a sexual abuse recovery coach in fact it's a title that i made up because when it came time to do this work in the way that i wanted to do it i i couldn't even find this particular lane as something that already existed really? uh, but all, ultimately you know my intention was to be a high school english teacher <laughs> that was really um the direction that i thought my life was heading in uh until i hung out with some high schoolers <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, no, back up, back up, reassess, reassess. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see that. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, and so where I was in my my own life, I had switched to doing elementary education and I was working at a private elementary school actually and doing kind of their after school program. Um, but then I also uh, developed curriculum for the computer um, science uh, methods and keyboarding and all of that. And then when I came to California in 2004, um, life was again shifting and I decided to be a nanny. <laughs> so I did that um, for eight years, actually. And in the midst of all of that, I was married at the time and I uh, we divorced in 2005 or so, 2006. And um, my life, again, was at one of those turning points. And I had been doing some healing work around my own trauma. I was abused by my grandfather uh, from about the ages of 10 or so to about 11 and a half, 12. And, uh, but I really found myself in a moment of reflection and thinking about what my future was going to look like. Uh, I just, I was coming out of a 10 year marriage and or a relationship slash marriage that had been pretty abusive verbally and physically and emotionally. And I just remember, you know, this moment of sitting on my floor in this new apartment. I didn't have anything. I, at that moment, I had just like a sleeping bag and a lamp and a real sit down talk with myself. Like, what am I doing? If I don't really deal with this trauma, I am just going to keep kind of surviving my life instead of living it. And so it was, you know, kind of a get your shit together kind of moment for me, honestly, and face the music and deal with it. And so that moment really spurred me to take my own trauma on. And so I started reading a lot more, um, investigating, but through a very different lens. I really wanted to think about how do I actually heal? What do I actually need to do? in order to feel better, in order to change my life. And so um, I began to practice that and work at that and use myself as a guinea pig. And as I saw my life improving, I felt like I'd kind of hit on something. And I thought, oh, you know, I wonder if this might help other people as well. And so I was in church at the time and I went to the care pastor there and said, you know, I, I think I have something that might help other people. Will you support me in bringing this to some women in our community? And turns out he had been sexually abused as well. So had a, you know, a real heart for this, you know, population. And so I found some women who were willing to be my guinea pigs, quite honestly, <laughs> you know, and I told them, I was like, I don't know, like, we'll just see what happens. Right. And so, you know, um, I did that two years in a row, um, kind of developing this program and trying things out and pulling from other curriculums, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of that, I thought, yeah, I'm onto something here. And I think this could actually be um, a way that I would like to spend my days. And so then I went and got my master's in counseling psychology and, you know, learn more and study neuroscience and more formalized what is now the beyond surviving program. And here I am now. So that was 2007, right? So when this all started, so how now I'm here, you know, decades later and, um, 
doing this every day with people who are really at that place in their journey where they're that I'm sick and tired of feeling broken and unfixable and going around the mountain again and again and again. And I just want like actual solutions. What are the steps? Point the way. Uh, and so that's, you know, how I found my way here at this, you know, chapter and version of my life. We'll see what the next chapter is and where life takes me next. But yeah, <laughs> that's, how, that's how you got here. And your I'm going to use your term. I'll put the air quotes around them. The guinea pigs, the process that you took them through. Is it very similar to what you're doing now? Or do you look back at that and go, ooh, I may have done something a little off on, on, you know, a few of the initial people, but for the most part, what I did worked and you've just yeah. enhanced on it is how do you feel about your initial workings? Yeah, I felt like I, everything was okay. Like I didn't have, uh, of course I'm learning and like, oh, even today I still learn like, oh, it would have been better to ask this question or to go in that direction or approach it this way. We're always kind of learning when it comes to, you know, supporting other human beings. Right. Um, but the the core, as far as the material, um, I was actually using a, a shelter from the storm, which is like a faith-based uh, program workbook. And I, but I was building on top of that exercises and practices and perspectives that were born out of my own kind of research and study okay. um, and things that I had done that had helped me. And so it was kind of this hodgepodge. And actually, when I was thinking, okay, I think I want to go and like maybe do this full time, but gosh, do I have to write my own curriculum? I literally called the woman who wrote Shelter from the Storm, Cynthia Cubitin, and I was like, you know, do you think you could just like rewrite this, but do it in a more secular way? <laughs> bless her heart she was like let me pray about that and of course the answer was no so then I was stuck with it okay I've really actually got to write my own thing and I still like I referenced some of the exercises and some of the quotes from her book because there is some really nice um, pieces in there um, but for the most part I built out you know so now that and I would say the curriculum evolves a little bit every year you know as I get feedback from clients or I think a little bit like oh like this might be a better way to explain that concept or to illustrate this idea. So it's ever evolving. Um, but uh, the main kind of tenets and pillars of the program are pretty set at this point. Right. And I, I noticed that you said you stepped away from it's it was more religious based and you've moved to a secular base. But does spirituality or religion play a role in the work that you do? Yeah, I would say that it's really a user's choice kind of, you know, invitation. So when clients come to me who have are really strongly rooted in um, Christianity or Buddhism or um, Islam, then like we kind of think about how do we bring some of those tenets and those practices and layer them in um, to the healing work uh, that we're doing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. And I know we talked about it before coaching versus therapy can you can you sort of elaborate on the differences and the strengths of of the one versus the other um mm -hmm. from your perspective sure so one of the things that as i've been doing this work in in looking back on reflecting on my own process and my own journey and then hearing you know kind of the journey of other people what started to stand out to me is kind of these three what i think of as stages of healing and so the first stage I describe as the victim stage, which is when we're uh, really in a state of denial. Uh, we're not yet at a place where we want to look at and acknowledge and talk about what happened. We're kind of in that place of like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that stuff's over there. And I'm over here trying to, you know, I'm gonna live my life. I'm good. I'm fine. Right. And, you know, that only lasts so long. Usually there's something that happens, a relationship crisis or a career crisis or just an internal kind of breakdown that says, okay, like enough is enough. I'm going to have to kind of pay attention to this and, and acknowledge um, the trauma and how it's continuing to impact me today. And so that for me is like the bridge of acknowledgement that moves someone from the state of victimhood into this state of survivorship. Right. And therapy is a fabulous when you're at that stage and at that moment, because you're at the early days, you're just beginning to maybe talk about and acknowledge what happened. You're wanting to maybe even just learn about trauma. And this is the stage where I think of like becoming very book smart about trauma. So you learn all the lingo and you start to kind of connect the dots and therapeutic relationships are really supportive in that time because therapy is most of the time, there are different modalities, right? In, within the big umbrella of therapy, but by and large therapy is about reflection and modeling. And so 
the therapist is um, client driven, meaning the client sits down on the couch and starts talking. And whatever the client is talking about is where the cl- the therapist kind of journeys and travels with them. Yeah. Right. And, um, and so, especially if you're looking into things like di- wanting a diagnosis or, you know, wanting to get some support around med management, these kinds of things, therapy, you, you really sits really well in that place. Right. As I was doing my master's in counseling psychology, I thought I was going to become a marriage and family therapist. And that was going to be kind of the track I would take, though I knew I would still be primarily focusing on people with sexual trauma. But as I was doing the coursework, I was like, ooh, like, mm, that doesn't really resonate with me, like some of the legal ethics stuff. (laughs) Like, I don't think I could hold myself to that rule because it just didn't make sense. It seemed seemed really contradictory. Um, And I started to think about how in those early days with the first women who went through the program, a huge part of the feedback that I got was uh, that what was supportive beyond the tools that I was teaching was the way in which I was able to use my own experiences to illustrate the, the moments. And like, yes, I've been there. Let me tell you about the time I lost my shit and threw the Tupperware all over the house. (laughs) Right. Like, you know, like that level of, you know, transparency, which is, you know, really discouraged within the therapeutic lens and container. Of course. Um, I also didn't want to be limited by location. I wanted to be able to have really a broader reach. And so therapy, you know, is really by state. You get licensed within a state. You work with people by state. Right. And I, you know, thought, gosh, there's just so many people who are in rural areas or parts of the world that don't have access. You know, since I've started this program, I've had clients in Ireland, Saudi Arabia, Africa, you know, uh, Spain, who, uh, UK, where they're like, you know, we just don't even have programs set up. Uh, And then I think the most important piece was the the place in which I really wanted to be solution focused. And I wanted to be in conversation with my clients and it be, again, that structured curriculum that I can do in coaching less so than I could do in therapy so that they come into session and we, they've done their reading, they've done their reflections, they've done their audio lessons, and I'm taking them very step by step. Um, because ultimately that's what I've spent all these years doing is, you know, developing an order of operations that says like, when we do this before this, we can actually maximize healing and minimize re-traumatization. And so it's kind of all of those different pieces that said, you know, coaching is the place to go. And, um, I think that's one of the strengths of coaching sometimes over therapy, not all therapies, but, that we're doing a little less of the reflection and the insight uh, gaining important piece of the puzzle. But when you get tired of that, when you start to feel that sense of like, I've talked about this every which way to Sunday, but yet I'm not moving, then that's where coaching and direct like skills-based practicing and um, collaborative um, kind of healing, I think comes in and, and proves to be a better option at that moment. So do you take a position of empathy or do you take a position of detachment when dealing with your clients? And the reason I ask it that way, uh, Mm -hmm. as much as you use your your experiences as example, if I'm taking I guess I'm looking at it from a therapeutic standpoint in the sense that if you are detached, you don't get emotionally involved. There's no this this very I know you have to build trust in conversations like this. I'm absolutely 100 percent behind the idea of establishing that trust and safety experience so that they know they can speak and not feel judged, not feel like they're being uh, their information is maybe going to be shared someplace. But there's a part of you that has to feel like I can't get too tied up in this. It's going to kill me. It's going to, I'm, I'm re almost like you're re-traumatizing yourself by reliving or hearing about their experiences or helping them. I know that the helping them get away from it helps you as well. It's sort of like you're taking a journey again and again and again, and it takes mm-hmm. you further along your path. But do you feel that you work better as a detached individual for the most part, or is it a really connected empathic person? Well, I think it's actually a very much a both and. So when I'm in session, you know, I'm in it 
and I'm with them and I'm listening through the, the lens of empathy. I'm listening through the lens of compassion. I'm also listening through the lens of coach and being compassionately challenging. Like there's your BS again. Like, what are we going to do about it? like, right. You know, like that piece of the puzzle. But then when the session is over, it's their life. Right. Right. And so I have to surrender that piece and I have to give back all the energy, you know, back to them and take back all of mine. And so, yeah, over the years, I've developed like those processes and strategies to hold the container for myself and have really good boundaries for myself. So there isn't, you know, enmeshment. Um, But ultimately, you know, I'm building, um, I'm building relationship with another human being. And I think that was part of also what kind of pushed me away from therapy like at a certain point with my clients, when they've been along long enough, like we'll say, I love you. Great job, girl. Like, like it's really like connection and human to human. Yeah. And my clients, when I'm going through, like if I, I've gotten hurt right late recently and like, they send me these little gifts and these little things and um, you know, they, and even my graduates, you know, years and years later will send me, you know, little note cards and postcards of their family. And oh, I just had a baby or I just got married. And so, you know, I wanted it to be relational. And then beyond me, the community that gets created, that's the really important part. And so that actually also helps me be able to step back because I'm saying, look, I'm not the queen bee here. Yeah. Like I'm just a a vessel and a support that's kind of helping direct you, but look at all the people that you have access and that you can connect to and build your tribe there because I'm not always going to be around or I'm not always going to be available. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that also helps me kind of hold some boundary and separation. But at the end of the day, I think the bottom line thought there is I have to surrender to, I can bring you information. I can offer you guidance and invitation, but then after that, like it's your life, live it. And so you get to choose and you have to chart the course. And I just get to continue to be kind of like the cheerleader and help you course correct, you know, when need be. Right. So you're, you say that you build a, a community um, and of those people, those are people that you've worked with in the past, some of your clients. I, I take it that that's the community that you're building and it allows for new clients and other clients to feel, A, I'm not alone and B, I do have a social network of people that understand me and I'm not, I don't look, I'm not looked at as pariah. Like, oh, you're one of those. Yeah, you're, right. You're us. It's one of us. We've all been through something similar. You can share things, you know, somebody can wake up in the middle of the night and have a panic attack or whatever and know sort of what it's about, but reach out to someone else and say, hey, huh. I know it's early in the morning, but I just went through something. Have you had anything like this? That's what you're building. Is that the kind of thing that you're looking yeah. to Yeah. So there's kind of the public facing group, which is the healing from sexual abuse Facebook group, which is open just to anyone who identifies as having experienced this, you know, trauma and allies also are in that space. Sometimes spouses or parents come into that space because they want to kind of learn and understand um, what the experiences of their loved one is. And then there's the private beyond survivors Facebook group. So that that's for people who have actually gone through the program or in the program. So the conversations can be a little different, but ultimately either space provides that kind of level of support so you can post and then for my beyond survivors they often end up very interconnected so they have each other's phone numbers and they go and visit each other right oh i happen to be in town or you know on this side of the country let's you know plan a little meetup and so yeah i mean that for me is i think one of the things i'm most proud of in the work is really seeing the way um, that they support and love on each other and show it up for each other and feel empowered to do that right like i actually have something to offer here um, when it comes to receiving, first of all, being able to receive care and ask for support, that's a big part of the Beyond Surviving program is like, like all of imagine. that stuff that you're holding about, like, I don't want to be a burden and I don't deserve it. And <laughs> I don't, you know, it's just, nobody's going to be able to help me anyway. Like just really, um, you know, challenging all of that such that they can even be in that moment of panic. And instead of going into judgment or hiding, they instead reach out. And then on the other side, people feeling really empowered, like they have something to offer um, and something to say that can be supportive and helpful to others. That's phenomenal, phenomenal work. And for you to say that there's not a lot of this out there, and I know doing my own research, there is not a lot of this out there. 
Um, part of me, my immediate, I've got a, a business brand and part of me thinks you should franchise, you know, and internationally, you should take some of your material, franchise, train your trainers, and then have them out there in different areas, building the exact yeah. same international community, simply because if it's not out there, you're going to be burnt out. You're going to be overwhelmed. The more people mm -hmm. see it, the more people want it. And at some point you're going to reach threshold of, I can't do 24 meetings a day because that gives me an hour for each person and I need to right. sleep at some point in time, right? So, it's you know. It's true, uh, it's true. <laughs> yes, this is a conversation that comes up for me about every five years. Okay. It's like, okay, like how big do I want it to be? Am I ready for that next step? Am I content <laughs> with where it is? How do I pass it on as a legacy? And there's, you know, all these swirly whirly ideas. And um, I've, you know, I've dabbled in the world of, you know, facilitator training mm -hmm. and, you know, I've touched on that every once in a while. You know, a lot of times my colleagues, um, particularly therapists, will get the Beyond Survival guidebook um, and then they can use that as like kind of a structure and curriculum and that gives people like you know a good chunk of what beyond surviving is um right. and so i love thank you you plant the seed again it keeps coming <laughs> so i receive it i will continue <laughs> so you have to i mean i i know and i've spoken to a few people that have been through the experience and did not have the 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 tool set to reach out or a community to reach out to and say hey this is somebody who can help me guide me through my processes a lot of them have gone through it on their own or have gone through multiple variations of different therapies and different medicines and and other effects just to get them to what they consider as a baseline and to have a standard set of processes that is individualized as well is is something that I'm sure there's a vast number of people that are still unspoken that hearing about this, and hopefully they'll be part of the audience, hearing about this will say, hey, you know, how do I reach out? What do I do? And I'm going to probably plug you at the end, the uh, the Rachel Grant coaching site, go to the website and, and you can start from there. Um, yeah. You can also put a plug up for your uh, the Facebook pages, because I think people do need to have a place where they can start. If they only hear words, a lot of people, they forget the words and they go, what was that thing? Ah, never mind. I won't bother, you know, because they've been hiding it for so long. But to have it in their face and to say, hey, it's a first step and they have to make the choice themselves. We've had that conversation. I've had it with other individuals mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. You can't be helped until you are ready to be helped. If you haven't made the choice, it's not going to happen. Like nobody can force mm -hmm. you to be better. You have to sort of in your own self say, I want to move forward. Right? Fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I think that's really true. Everybody hits that moment and it comes about for, you know, various different reasons. And um, I think that this is one of the reasons why I created the checklist about the three stages of healing, because it does kind of, it's a soft, gentle way for people to kind of get into the conversation with themselves about, well, even if I just understand a little bit about the landscape is, then it won't be so scary, maybe even to think right. about like, okay, well, these are the goals and intentions of each stage, the best kind of support. And, you know, when you're in that place of denial, like you're not full on. And so taking advantage of like, even in coming and just being an observer in the Facebook group and not even posting or beginning to listen to my podcast. Like these are gentle ways to start. And the more you have these moments of like, oh, that sounds like me. Oh, I struggle with that too. Oh, wait, this isn't just, I'm like broken and a mess, but yeah. this is just an outcome of the trauma injury. Oh, then you start to feel more empowered. And like that shame starts to just get, you know, gentle enough or quiet enough that you can say, you know what, getting some support on, on the, around this could actually really make a difference in my life. Yeah. And also they don't feel alone when they start reading That's the material it. that you have, they, they begin to realize this isn't just about me. This isn't just yeah. me. The biggest issue that I've seen talking with people of overcoming this is they felt I'm this is normal or I'm alone in this mm, and yeah. they don't want to share it. They don't want to share if it's normal because it's like saying I breathe. Right. Congrats. Mm, right. Like, what's the big deal? I should be over this already. It shouldn't be that yeah, bad. Everybody of a thing. Does yeah. this. Everybody's mm -hmm. there. Or mm -hmm. it's I'm the only one. And if I bring it up, it's like I'm saying I saw aliens. Nobody's yeah. going to believe me and nobody's going to care yeah. because it's not. Oh, come on. It's not true. It's only you. Right. But as soon as they start realizing that, no, there's a vast number of people that have been through what you've been through, that have experienced what you've experienced, that are feeling what you're feeling. Okay, I'm not alone. I can do I can I've got a community, yeah. a 
like-minded people, I'm going to start listening. A quote that I have, and I've got it in front of me, a quote from another individual that was talking about similar topics said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. And it's a really solid statement. Yeah, simple. True. If you don't do anything, nothing's yeah. going to happen. You'll right? get the same so, results again yeah. and again. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 Again, I'll say, I'm going to give you kudos. It's phenomenal to have the resources that you've put out there. It is absolutely phenomenal that they're there. I wish, and I'm hoping that just this interview alone will bring more people to the table. Just them seeing it, just them getting the idea. I'm going to watch this just to see what happens and to see it and to say, oh, okay, there's a, you mean there's a community? I can be part of a, a gentle community that's not going to force me to do anything. And then maybe when I'm ready, I can take the next step and slowly move myself through this. Absolutely phenomenal. And as you pointed out, a uh, therapist is not a guide. A therapist is a listener who helps you understand yourself. A coach is a guide. They will mm. take you by the hand and walk you through a process. Some of them that might be difficult for you, but they're there to say, it's okay. You're not alone. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get you through this. And that's something that is really required for some people because they do feel like nobody's here to help me. I've talked to a ton of people mm. again and again and again. They've listened, but it's gone nowhere. I need somebody to take me by the hand and take me to places yeah. that I have no idea how to get there. I just don't right. know the step, the first of my foot where the hell do i start yeah no i think that's so true most of the people come to me who are, are in that similar boat right and i think the other thing that uh the reason why i come into this place of you know curriculum of course is my background in education but it's also when you're thinking about trauma this injury it really impacts the brain, the nervous system, the spirit, the mental life, the emotional life, the relational life. And so when you do start to come into the place of acknowledgement, oftentimes the feeling is like, well, there's the mountain of things, you know, it's like this big old ball of spaghetti, right? And it's like, as soon as I pull one thing, well, then there's this thing over here I have to deal with. And then I try to, oh, but then wait, there's this thing that I have to deal with over here. And it just feels so insurmountable. And that's distressing when you're already in a state of maybe despair or not feeling very hopeful about your life. And so when you come into the Beyond Surviving program and you have me there to say, look, I know the mountains over here, but we're not worried about it. We're just step number one. That's it. Just this little frame. That's all we're talking about are going to work on this week. Let's, you know, integrate that. And then exactly that breaking it down into parts just makes it more approachable, more doable. And um and we can also then have some playfulness also and silliness. I think sometimes people are surprised how much they laugh <laughs> together talking about sex. But that to me is another major tenet of beyond surviving. Like healing doesn't have to be this like deep, dark, heavy thing all the time. Like, yes, there are going to be challenges. Yes, we're going to push into the stuff that is painful. Uh, but we can also find, you know, the humor in life and the lightness in life. And we can use that even as a part of our, our healing process. Right. And and I'm just out of curiosity, I'm sure that it does fit that because I know when we spoke, we talked about the neuroscience of trauma uh, mm. and PTSD, but are you leveraging the, the scientific methodology behind neuroplasticity and rewiring the brain? You talk about using humor, and I would say that's probably part of the neuroplasticity where you're rewiring in a positive way to mm -hmm. say, even though you have a negative experience that you're reliving the humor allows for that experience not to be traumatic, but to be something that you kind of go, oh, a relief method, right? I've, I've looked at it mm -hmm. and I've felt relief as opposed to fear and avoidance, which would then build the anxiety model, right? So yeah, I take it that you do, your steps do walk through that, the we ride, the, mm -hmm. my tongue just went off sideways, rewiring process. Um, yeah, in, yeah. I mean, I have to say like in my own journey, when I was reading and researching and uh, further developing the tenants and the, the foundations of the program. When I was in my master's program, I came across Dan Siegel's work, um, specifically his book, The Developing Mind. And it blew my mind. And I was like, whoa, like it just, it made so many things click into place. Like, oh, that's why I react that way. Oh, that's why I have that particular kind of thought process or emotional um, reaction. And the neuroscience of trauma just was so fascinating to me because I began to understand it like, oh, the brain has just been patterned to do this certain thing. It's just been, you know, um, developed um, as he calls it, like, in, like 
the involuntarily wired, um, you know, connections that happen because of abuses and traumas and lived experiences and, you know, all the things. And the fact that we can voluntarily or intentionally change the firing patterns that were laid down voluntarily. That's a direct quote of Dan Siegel. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Give me that. Give me that. <laughs> I want that. Yeah. Yeah. And then later research by Dr. Karen Purvis, who studied a neural synapses and how those are built and developed and that it takes about 400 repetitions in order to create a new synapsis in the brain. Right. And so if we think about belief systems as like just these firing patterns, so we're having these lived experiences and the brain is just very quickly determining kind of the why of it and pulling in like the associations and the data that's sitting there. Um, you know, those develop over a long period of time. And so when we're trying to then redirect the brain and build like what I call exit ramps, right, and get off of that autopilot, build the new neuronal pathway, 400 repetitions of, you know, bringing in the new thought or the new belief or the new perspective, unless you incorporate play. And then it only takes 10 to 20 repetitions. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, let's do that. Why? Like, let's yeah. play then, right? And I think on a deeper level, bringing back in play is important for people who've experienced childhood trauma because we missed out on a lot of play. We missed out on a lot of silliness and being kids and, you know, feeling, you know, having to grow up very fast in a lot of ways. And so there's also, not only is it great for the brain and really healing the brain and retraining the brain and the nervous system, I think also on a deeper, I would even say spiritual level, reclaiming our child self and our playfulness. I always say it's never too late to have a, a great childhood. Mm -hmm. And we can start that at any moment. Yeah. Well, that the, the sense of play also, I mean, even people who have experienced that kind of trauma, that kind of abuse at a later stage in their life, not in their childhood, probably have a sense of guilt of being happy about things because they're blaming themselves or possibly other reasons for this sort of darker side to themselves. And by imposing or allowing for play, and not judging based on it, they have this re-energized sense of I can be happy again. I can I can re-exist without this thing that happened and be able to look at it and know it for what it is, but feel good about themselves. And like you say, be able to play, be able to experience their childhood again at a later date in life, right? They go back to, yay, I can be innocent again, because really it is a stripping of innocence mm, in these circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there's this. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'd, I'd like you to add because I'm doing way too much talking on this. So please, if you have something to elaborate on. No, it just I just think there's this way in which, um, you know, the task of healing from sexual trauma is no small thing. But when we can begin to gain that perspective that we're talking about here of what happened, why did it happen, um, really shifting where, you know, we set the cause and the blame. Um, and then we, I think so much of the work that I'm doing is really about helping people claim or reclaim, you know, their sense of self and their perspective about life and how they want to show up in the world. And ultimately just being able to come more and more into what we call like that adult empowered self. Right. Um, and so, because what's interesting is that um, myself included, I was very childish. Like I remember in my early 20s, I was in a row with my um, partner at the time and I literally fell on the floor, like into a temper tantrum, like kicking, screaming. You would have thought I was a five-year-old kid, but in many ways I was, right? My emotional maturity, my emotional capacity, my window of tolerance, all of these things, you know, had been abbreviated, stunted because of the abuse. And so sometimes it's interesting, this tension between between playful versus childish because a lot of people come in with that sense of like ah like I'm immature and I I act out and I you know I, and so they like you know state want to avoid that but we have to make that distinction between like immaturity and childishness versus playfulness um and joy and all of that yeah childlike versus childish yeah yeah 
Um, another question I have concerning the, the the mental health aspects of it is, do you have initial discussions about just their physical well-being? Because I know the ability to affect the mind requires the mind to be in good health, right? The brain, mm -hmm. neuroplasticity and helping them work through trauma works better if they're drinking the right amount of water, their diet is good. Mm -hmm. Uh, their other physiological issues uh, are are dealt with. So if they're experiencing they've got like something major, other physiological trauma going on in their life, it might be more difficult for them to go through mental processes mm -hmm. and helping themselves or a different tack to allow them mm -hmm. th the time and the requiredness that a normal a person within you know normal boundaries. Why I'm saying that is that myself, um, I'm not drinking enough water. I'm not getting enough sleep. And I know I have mental clicks every once in a while. Something will happen. And it's a trigger that I don't even, even know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. But it occurs. And I know it's occurring because it's not healthy. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. doesn't, mm -hmm. it's dried out. It doesn't have enough water. It doesn't have enough, you know, I give it the right amount of yeah. nutrients, I think. But the sleep is required. So do you start sure. the process by talking about the health first? No, I am. Um, I think that it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation, right? And so there's this way in which as we're working on the nervous system regulation and as we're working on, you know, shifting perspective and building in a bit more choice autonomy, that people then start to take more atten pay more attention to those other things like oh. my sleep routines. Oh. And also like sleep disruption is often a direct outcome um, and symptom of nervous system dysregulation. Right. And so if I just, if I get the nervous system in a healthy place and back into like that window of tolerance, and then often the sleep and the focus and the decision making um, will shift, right? Mm -hmm. So with some people there, I do like exactly everybody's a little different. So sometimes if they're in a very unstable environment or situation, well, we've got to like address that first. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll do and, and particularly if people really bring it very much forward in the beginning sessions, then we'll I do like little band aid fixes like, okay, <laughs> here's this little piece and like, yeah, a little bit of accountability around um, that. And ultimately, the education around the window of tolerance is really important because understanding that we all have that space in which our nervous system is operating um, at a healthy you know, pace or rate. And we can take challenges or stressors and they'll be challenging or stressy. But they don't send us into full blown like activation or dissociation. Right. Um, but whenever, yeah, most people coming in, I'm like, your window of tolerance is kind of like this, which is why I like that dirty sock on the floor it makes you want to lose your ish, right? <laughs> like, and like, you know, throw someone at your partner. And, but as we retrain the brain, we eliminate triggers, we, you know, help, help slow down the system. That's a big part of it, being able to pause and slow down you know, that window of tolerance is going to increase. And so then those things that once were disturbing or super frustrating, upsetting or dysregulating, triggering, no longer will have that impact. And if you go a week and you have a lot of bad sleep or you have a cold or you're about to like maybe start something really brand new or you have a big event coming up, like the window of tolerance can close. And so then there's that feeling of like, man, I thought I could handle this thing. And now I'm like stressed out or activated again. See, I'm not healing. I'm not getting better which isn't true at all. It's just that that window of tolerance closed a little. So now we want to like, well, what are the protocols like sleep and, you know, nutrition and, you know, uh, hydration, all of those kinds of things, along with like movement, et cetera, that are going to help to increase that window of tolerance again. So in the, in the beginning, you set those expectations, you allow them to understand that, yeah, you may go through something as we're going through this process that may, as you say, reduce your window of tolerance in places and you'll notice it and you'll think nothing's happening. It's, oh, it's all falling back and, you know, into place and you aren't, you aren't helping me, blah, blah, blah. And what you do is you simply say, no, when you experience those, we'll work on the things that have caused that to come down and see if we can yeah. bring your, your window of tolerance back up. And I like that because then you're yeah. essentially allowing for not only guiding them through the healing process, but you're guiding them through their own personal processes where things can happen. Life happens. Or what's oh, the yeah. other word that, that the other word happens. I don't tend to say that very often, but yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it does, you're available to help them through that as well, because it impacts yeah. that overall process. And it's good to hear yeah. that because some people right. only focus on, we're walking you through this. Oh, but today I had a car accident. That's irrelevant. 
this is this and it's no it's not because it's part and parcel of the person it is yeah it's a stressor that's right that's right a stressor that then can have lots of different consequences like how do i get to work and the money i have to spend and like this that the other right and all these kinds of things that then can be yeah and that's i often say that to my clients like i can't stop life from happening you know life is going to happen but mm. how we react and we respond to the things that happen in life that's really where it's at yeah. And do we have this capacity to like, again, slow down, take that breath, use a tool, get perspective, which one of them always is the asking for support, you know, and getting, per getting perspective from someone else and helping, having somebody else help you to kind of slow down and remember a tool to use. Um, Cause we're not always able to do that um, on our own independently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so much easier when someone shows you how to use a tool, even if you think, you know, I, I watch TV as mm -hmm. all this works, but until somebody, you pick it up and you go, Oh, that doesn't feel like I thought it would, like I saw on TV and somebody sure. goes, okay, this is what you do with it. And they show you and you, Oh, that's so easy. Wow. And they give you that support to say, you did it really well. You did it really. That's exactly how you need to do it. That's perfect. Whereas you watch TV yeah. and somebody does it and nobody's talking to you and you pick up a hammer and you don't know what it's for. And you kind of go, bam, and you <laughs> miss the nail head. <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm crappy at this. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, and, yeah. So having sure. guidance, even with the simplest of tools, is way better than trying to use those tools on your own. You must have been through an enjoyable experience when you started doing it for yourself because you didn't have you to help you. Well, you did have you to help you walk through it, but having you to do you, uh, the, unless you've got this beautiful <laughs> split brain. <laughs> I often do, I, you know, I do have some processes where like I, I you know, I, writing has always been a great processing tool for me. So I would, you know, write and ask questions and then have to respond to them and, you know, kind of being coached, right? Okay. So if I were coaching myself in this moment, what would be the question that I would ask or what's the reflection that I would give about this attitude or this belief or this assumption? Um, and, uh, but still, you know, I have to absolutely when I'm going, particularly when I'm going through things that are mm, challenging or new, mm -hmm. uh, getting coached, being coached is, is important. And having, I have my own mentors and my own guides, you know, in my life, because, um, you know, all of us have our, our blind spots, right. Um, or just sometimes it's helpful. It can like accelerate the process. And I think that's often, you know, the case, a lot of, um, you know, there's this way in which I think we all have a sense of internal wisdom and maybe we could even get to the information or get to the outcomes. It's just a matter of, you know, we can speed up the process a bit, you know, and when we have that external kind of accountability um, and of course, someone who's gone, you know, before us and so can take away some of the mystery or the missteps and the, you know, course correction that has to happen when you're trying to do it, you know, all on your own. Yeah, I was going to say, if you were doing it, as you said, for yourself, where you say, oh, I should, how would I answer is how, what questions would I ask myself? Do you find yourself more self-critical of yourself when you're doing mm -hmm. it on your own, where you're being really, really intensive on yourself to say, no, that's not the question I would ask. I would ask a different question, different from how you would treat your clients, because it's you and you're being like, I got to be better at this than this. I have to be much better. <laughs> <laughs> no, not so much. Not so much. I, uh, I've worked a lot in my life to find um, a lot of spaciousness for my messiness and for my humanity. Um, and, you know, compassion for me is, you know, always the name of the game. For me, it's the first step for almost everything is to just breathe and say, all right, this is what's happening. This is what's so this is what I'm feeling. And it's all okay. And I don't have to judge it. I don't even have to explain it or even understand it necessarily as that first step. I can just wrap myself in some love and compassion. And then in that space of nurturing, then I can get curious and say, all right, is this, you know, working? Is this not working? Why are we finding ourselves here in this, you know, particular mindset or emotional state? And then I can get curious about it. But, um, you know, I... I'm still human. So there are times, of course, where I will beat myself up and like, oh, haven't you figured that out already? <laughs> <Come on." laughs> you know, but then, you know, exactly. I hear that they're few and far between, but when they come up, then it's just met immediately with that place of, you know, compassion. Yeah.
Well, that's good. That's it. Sounds like you've worked enough at this that you are the right individual to be guiding others. Because if you're if you're not healthy yourself, you're giving other people direction in the same method that you would for yourself, which probably wouldn't be good, you know. But the fact that you don't beat yourself up, or you allow it for a bit, and then your own your own referee steps in and goes, no, 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 yeah. this is a good person. <laughs> so right. I have to ask because it is. I don't know if it's key. I'm just speculating, but for processes that you and your clients are going through, forgiveness, it's the big word. How does that play a role? When when, or if ever does it come in? And I'm not just referring to the external locus, I'm referring to the internal as well, because I know in a lot of cases, people blame themselves for anything that's happened to them. So how does that play a role in your process and does it and where does it fit in? Mm. Well, yeah. So if we look at it through self-forgiveness and then forgiveness of others. So I think that in the, er so I'll say Beyond Surviving is a 16 session program. And so roughly sessions five through seven is where we're really doing the work around perspective of how we hold the abuse and why it happened and what caused the abuse. Mm -hmm. And so beginning to really shift the blame from self, like there's something that I did or there's something about who I am or even the, the thoughts that come up about like I wanted it because I, you know, I kept going to their house or my body responded um, you know, all of those belief systems when we, you know, you know, chunk away at those and begin to get things, get causation correctly assigned, that releases a lot of that shame and a lot of that self-blame. And so that, you know, begins to, you know, stir the pot of self-forgiveness and even just to seeing in some ways, like in that context, as far as causation, I have nothing to forgive myself for. Right because I didn't do anything wrong. And then later in life, when we are more at choice and we're making choices and oftentimes they are derivative trauma, but yet we are adults, we have agency and therefore we have regrets um, and we can see places in which maybe we've caused harm or we've behaved in ways that we're not so proud of. Then yeah, finding ways to make amends with ourself, um, finding ways to, um, again, that compassion piece, like, well, you know, I can only behave and respond to myself and into the world and to others based on the knowledge and the experience and the life learning I had at the time, you know, so in my twenties, when I'm throwing a fit and throwing, you know, Tupperware, like I don't condone that, right. As my older adult self, I can look back and say, well, that wasn't such a great choice, but I can also say, and at the same time, that's the capacity that I had to deal with that situation. And right. so that's where that place of like releasing um, the blame and holding myself, you know, um, in a place of like pain and guilt about it, you know, can go. When it comes to people who've caused us harm and how do we hold them out of the 16 sessions, this concept and idea of forgiveness is session 14. Okay. Cause we've got a lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work to do before we can even hold space for that right. kind of conversation. Right. And for me, it really comes down. I love using just through the lens of the, the Hebrew word for forgiveness when you translate it into English is to send away. And I love that invitation to think of forgiveness as a process of choice. Number one, like verb action, not a feeling. It's not something that like comes over me and the angels sing. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, no, it's like active choice. You know, it's a verb. It's an action. And, you know, I get to choose whether I'm going to continue to hold this attachment and have this experience continue to be the thing that informs and influences where my life can go and how I can feel, or do I want to let that go? Do I want to cut that thread? And then of course, how do we do that? How do we achieve that separation? Mm -hmm. But I think framing that it that way as a process, that's about freeing yourself and sending away the attachment that you hold to the person or to the trauma um, really um, helps people access that idea. Um, but it's important because oftentimes people will feel pressured into the thought of forgiveness, like especially sometimes, unfortunately, under certain, um, you know, religious constructs. Mm -hmm. As soon as something happens, you forgive. And, you know, there's this, you know, this idea and you can end up bypassing a lot of your feelings 
And that has to actually be named and acknowledged and expressed, um, as well as, again, shifting the cause and the blame. And if we don't do those things, then it's not really going to fully integrate in the system as a place of freedom and really being let go or away from the, pa- the pain. And the thing is, what what comes to mind when I hear this is letting go. And yet I'm somebody who's my memory. I have memories since I was two years old and they're all there. I can bring them all back like they're yesterday, every single one of them. For some people, they may say, yeah, but I'm not going to forget. How do I forget what happened? And to me, I'm sure you have a process of explaining that you'll still have memories, but they're like photographs, photographs Mm -hmm. that you can recognize. But like you say, the attachment to the photograph no longer yeah, yeah. exists. The, the emotional connection yeah. to the photograph, you may still feel anger maybe, but then that's the work process I'm, I'm assuming that goes on where it becomes less about your emotional response to it and more about this happened. It's a historic fact. And there's no more of me feeling anything about this. I do on occasion because you're a human being. There will still be those ratty little neurons that will not let go of certain aspects of things. But you've built a whole mechanism around that to say, I know what that is. I know why that's happening. And I can get past it. I'm not afraid of it. I can look at it in the face and know where it comes from and know what it is. And maybe I'll let myself respond a little bit to it and then say, okay, you've had that. Now let's move forward. I'm I'm assuming that's that's the work that you do. No, that's really well said. Yeah. You know, when I start with someone in the program, we're talking about the idea, we're really doing two things. It's integration of trauma and trauma resolution. And then it's also like just adulting, like growing up, (laughs) like what are the skills and the things that you need to have in your life in order to navigate your relationships, uh, your career, your life in an adult empowered way. Trauma integration to me has everything with being able to neutralize that experience. So in the beginning, when the wound is still open, if you will, then everything is very, very tender. And, you know, very, you know, there are lots of things that can really set off, um, you know, a whole patterning of, you know, trickle down responses and reactions and feelings um, and everything. It's almost like your life is out here and the spotlight is on the trauma and everything it feels very centrally focused about the abuse and even how you think about yourself how you think about others it's all through this kind of trauma lens and there's a lot of reactivity um and so as we work through the trauma and as we work on integration then we get perspective we get distance we get resolution such that it releases all of that negative charge and so for example, integration kind of sounds like this. Like I grew up in Oklahoma. I love peanut butter. I was sexually abused. I love to dance. Right. And so for me, energetically, when I'm in the wounded place, when the trauma is not integrated nervous system wise, I can say I'm a, I grew up in Oklahoma. I love peanut butter. My nervous system is staying here. But as soon as I think about the abuse, the trauma, there's this spike, there's this activation that happens because it's not integrated. And so once the integration happens, it all kind of holds that same tone. And if I sit and I really go into the memory, I really go into the full experience, take myself even back to very specific moments of abuse. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm going to feel something because I'm not a robot. (laughs) Right. And so, but there's this way. And this for me, I will say is one of my pet peeves a little bit about therapy um, or certain modalities, certain types of therapy and certain practices within therapy. I could sit and talk about this thing for the rest of my life. Like you can do that. You absolutely can. And you can keep poking it and you can keep poking it and you can find the next thing and you can fit, you know, this, that, or the other, Mm -hmm. but beyond surviving comes to this place of like, you know, I can live my life independent of the fact that I was abused Yeah, and I can step outside of that experience. It is not the central theme of who I am and what I've lived. And it becomes, you know, I sometimes say like life is this big old tapestry, you know, full of millions and millions of threads and integration has everything to do with like that, those moments of abuse and trauma, they're a thread, they're in there, they're part of your story, but they are not the main 
piece of the puzzle or the main thing that you need to spend your energy and your time on, you can resolve that and then you can, you know, quite literally move on. And if stuff does come up that, you know, pings that or pushes that button that you know how to, you know, regulate and how to walk through that moment um, as quickly as you want to. Because again, if something can come up and you can lean in and you can be with it, and sometimes there's value in that, but you can also say, oh yeah, I remember you. Thanks for showing up for a second. And then back to your present day life. Yeah. So when you said it's the central theme um, and the imagery, of course, in my head is that when you mentioned I'm from Oklahoma and before going through the process of, of, of combining or putting it within your, your life, as opposed to it being the central theme of your life, you would say I'm from Lo Oklahoma and your brain triggers where I was abused. I like peanut butter. And the smell of it brings me back to the room where I was abused. And I ha I like horses. And I remember outside the house where I was abused, there were horses. And where everything has, for some reason, some It can't some be like that, too. It can't be like that, too. Yes. Like, it's like, honestly, my, my ex was a real jerk. But one thing he said to me that was really hard, but actually really life transforming was like, Rachel, like, you don't always get to use I was sexually abused as the excuse. Or not everything is about the abuse. Like yep. what's going on here, right? And how you're showing up and all of that. And that was really hard to take in that in the moment. But ultimately, that's right. Like exactly. We could trace everything. Oh, that person looked at me this way, therefore that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and like we will just we'll we'll find it. And that has a lot to do with the brain too, like the power of focus and the way that we are constantly teaching the brain what to pay attention to and what to prioritize. Right. And so if our our kind of core self is still sitting in the identity of abused, even survivor. That's why I don't use that term, right? Then it sets a context in which whatever's happening in my world or how I'm feeling goes through that filter first. And, you know, our goal and beyond surviving is that you're not just surviving their life, that you get to live it and that you are able to actually just be in the present and future focused without everything. You know, you shift the lens, you stop seeing yourself just through the lens of trauma, um, which then allows you to see other people and your life and experiences in ways other than just through the lens of trauma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, you use the word filter, and I like that as a, as a means of it's sort of like having filters dropped in front of your eyesight, in front of your brain's capability of experiencing the world. Where I went through something, and everything is filtered through that. And as yeah. soon as you go through the process, the filter is removed, so you can experience the world. You see a lamp, you see a bird, and you go, "That's a beautiful bird," and nothing else. It's a beautiful nothing bird. Else. Yes. Oh, look at the sunrise. There's a sunrise. It's mm -hmm. absolutely phenomenal. I feel smell the air. I feel the breeze on my face. I see the sunrise. It's absolutely, ex it's an experiential uh, excitement that uh, is almost, and we'll bring back to the conversation, childlike, where it's the first time you've experienced it. It's yay. Yeah. And nothing's yeah. tied to it. There are no linkages to it. It's allowing you the process of. So now I'm going to bring you to uh, uh, an idea that formulates when I hear about this kind of, of, of process could this not be leveraged in a more general sense on basic PTSD? So oh, people yeah. experience a level of trauma that is impactful on their life in every aspect. Could this not be leveraged the same way? So take away the, the sexual component of it and simply label it as trauma and beyond surviving. Because so yeah. many people have come back from war situations, from, from disaster situations where they're, they've experienced a massive trauma. And now it is the filter of their life. It is the lens through which they see the world every day, every moment of every day. It's an anxiety that builds beyond their capability of control. And, you know, to leverage a tool set to say, let's walk you away from the trauma. Let's start stripping away this filter, this lens, so that you can start experiencing the world again without removing. I mean, we can't erase memory. So we're not talking about erasing memory. We're talking that's about right. rewiring the brain to stop making linkages to that memory. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And in fact, over the years that I've been doing this work, I have had people come to me who have not experienced sexual abuse, uh, but have experienced physical abuse or neglect or abandonment, marital rape, uh, military rape, 
Um, and so there are, you know, a handful of people who have gone through the Beyond Surviving program who have not experienced sexual abuse. And we see absolutely with a few modifications, um, but same outcomes, same results, same toolkit, you know, leads to those same. Yeah. In many ways, trauma is trauma is trauma. And so, yeah, we can kind of use this process um, again, sometimes with some modifications, but for the most part, it translates to healing trauma, regardless of type. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I see the value in that with individuals that have come back from war, like the Gulf mm. War. There are so many people that came back from that, mm -hmm. not ever having, they were young and they never experienced real war. They go through the training, they think they know what's going to happen, and then they see it for real and it traumatizes them because they've never, ever seen anything like that in their entire life. And now it becomes the focus of everything yeah. that happens in their life. And to yeah. Have something for them as well. I'm not saying you need to start, you know, change over. It's a new, it's a new paradigm for you, but it is something to think about if you've got a colleague who wants to leverage what you do. Yeah. Branch out, let them take it, and you just, you know, take <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, you know, all, all what I'm saying is the the station, the show that we're doing. There will be people that have gone through that, and for sure. me. I wouldn't want to leave them out of the conversation. I don't want no, them I to think you're right about it about you. In fact, this could be extremely helpful for you. And it's the first step is acknowledging it. So you can't heal quote from you. You can't heal what you don't name or you won't yeah. name. And yeah. that is your quote. And for some people, it may not be abuse, but it may be a trauma that they don't want to yeah. talk about. I don't want to talk about it. You have to start there and accept mm -hmm. the fact that you want to get help. If you don't want to get help, nothing's going to change, right? Yeah. You, don't, you can't change yeah. what you don't want to change. Um, but allowing for them to be able to reach out. And maybe you know people that could help them, allowing sure. them to reach out to you and say, hey, I haven't been through this, but you know somebody who could help me at least get a little bit of assistance with what's going on with me. So yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I love getting people connected into resources. So if I'm not the best fit or if I don't, you know, yeah, exactly. Have the right lens to support someone then yeah. Connecting them into my network for sure. Fantastic. Because like I said, that's what this, this interview and this program is about is getting people aware of the fact that there are resources out there. So many people don't know what's out there. And in your experience, right you didn't realize that there was so little out there and people reaching out to you and saying, uh, there was nothing else. Like, I mean, you are mm. phenomenal. There's nothing else out there. Why isn't there more of you? Um, mm. there's no cloning programs yet, but we may have to look Not at yet. that. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about franchise good. though, but yeah. cloning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I think, um, we've covered a lot today. Mm. Um, I think if we get some really positive feedback, I may have to have you back. Uh, oh, we'll I love that. Um, we have had another individual that came back a second time simply because of the amount of feedback that we received. Uh, so that may happen with you. And I'll reach out to you as soon as I know. Uh, we get a tumult of, of messages from people saying, I want to know more. Then we'll have to have you back. Um, as I say, if they want to check you out, Rachel Grant Coaching. If you want to mention your Facebook pages or page that they can mm. first approach, because the private one is for those individuals that you've worked with. Yeah. So, so facebook.com slash groups slash Real Talk with Rachel. Uh, I also believe if you go to Facebook and just type in Healing from Sexual Abuse Beyond Surviving, that you should be able to find our community there. If you also just go to the website, rachelgrantcoaching.com and click on like the freebies resources section, um, it'll be listed there as well as, long, as, uh, as well as things like my podcast and the monthly support group that I do and just other things that you can explore and check out, um, as well as, of course, the opportunity to apply apply for a consultation where we would then, you know, get together and meet and be able to explore working together. Um, so either way, you know, lots of great resources there. And if I can be a support to you in any way, reach out, don't hesitate. I'm here. And, you know, thank you so much just for this opportunity to come and share my story and my perspective about healing. You know, trauma is not a life sentence. We can get out there, we can live our lives and really thrive and, um, and move forward. So yeah, you don't have to stay where you are. You you're not, you're not in, you're no, not broken. You're not unfixable. We can heal. And yeah. you don't have to be a survivor either. You can get way beyond just surviving yeah. situations like yeah. this, which is, which is what you're doing. You're taking people away from the idea that oh, I've survived this. No, 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 no. You should have a t-shirt. I more than survived this. <laughs> I worked with. <laughs> nice. I'll get on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much thank for you. being here.
Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.